What is going on, guys? Welcome back to Season 1, Episode 2 of the Essential Oilers Podcast. I'm your host again, Andrew Bennett, Benny, and my co-host here, Scott Schweitzer, Schweitzy. Schweitz, how's it going today? Doing good, buddy. Get to enjoy the summer weather. Life's good. Got some stuff to talk about for hockey, so I'm Absolutely. all excited. Looking forward to it. Hopefully, I'm not going to be... I'm going to be a little quieter today. I'm not going to be screaming right in the mic. It's, uh, we got a little bit better set up here today, and uh, I'll try not to say 100% all the time. <laughs> I'll try not to call everybody a stud, so we're good. <laughs> awesome. <laughs> so I think we're going to start off here today. We're still waiting for that Darnell Nurse signing. Um, hoping that it's going to come soon so we have something more to chat about. However, since our last podcast, there was some big signings with uh, Matthew Dumba, Jacob Trubel with arbitration, and also Joel Edmondson. Um, I think this, I was interested when these happened because I'm like, oh sweet, these are guys that are, especially Dumbo, they're a year apart from Darnell Nurse, so this is going to be huge effect now on this signing, which is why I wish Darnell Nurse would have signed before these signings came uh-huh. out, because he's 100% going to use these now. 100%. 100%. Oh, <laughs> said it again. <laughs> oh, well. Um, so yeah, let's start off with uh, Matthew Dumba here. He signs a five-year deal, $30 million, with a $6 million annual average earning. Um, modified no trade clause in his last two years. So I think Dumba did well on this. I think he got paid. like he For his points, though, he did put up 50 points in 82 games last year with 14 goals, 36 assists. Really good numbers. Um like we were saying before, he played very well in the playoffs. Yeah. Um, for them, he ate a ton of minutes, uh, especially when Suter's gone. You can tell that Minnesota's definitely going to be, he's going to be the next up and coming D man. Oh, he is their next up and coming D man. Like he, he took over those playoffs for them without Ryan Suter and Zach Parise. Not gonna lie, like watching the Jets and them, I thought the Jets were going to sweep it. Yeah. And man, that was a close series. Yeah, like man, great. like they, they kept it in there. And man, Matt Dumba looked like. I'm throwing it out there. I thought he looked like one of the best defensemen overall out there. Like even oh, better absolutely. than Winnipeg. Like absolutely. he was dominant in everything he did. He was hitting. He was controlling the puck out there for like 30 minutes a night. Like the guy was unreal. And I thought, you know, like once again, like I thought he made out like a bandit with this deal. Like 50 points. Yeah, he did really good this year, and he's always been improving. Yeah. And he looked dominant out there. However, I was like five years six. I didn't think it was that bad for him, but I thought he was a five to five and a half million dollar man. That's the thing. I think he definitely turned it up in the right year, right in his contract year, and put up the, the best numbers he could to get that much money. I thought I don't I don't want to say that he was overpaid because he earns he's earned all the money yeah. that he's gotten. It's just a it's just a lot of money for him, which is good. And like you said, um, that playoff series only went five games, but every game was so tight. Mm-hmm. Like that, both, all those games could have pretty much went either way. And like at the before the playoffs started, if you had been like, "Yo, Swites, who who's gonna be the sweep of the season?" I was like, or sweep of the playoffs. Where I was like, "Man, Winnipeg's gonna sweep." Minnesota. Oh, they're, they're gonna run them over, and every game's gonna be like a four nothing game. Like mm-hmm. there's not not gonna be any competition there. It wasn't gonna be close. And guess what, man? That was like every game was close. And like you said, I think Dumbo was a huge part of that. So. So he gets paid a little bit more than what we were expecting, which is good for him again. But uh, I think that will affect the Darnell Nurse. Right shortly after that, uh, Jacob Truba gets an arbitration deal. One year, $5.5 million. Um, looking at Truba last year, he put up 24 points in 55 games. He was injured for a little bit there. Mm-hmm. Um, and then also he took some time off at the beginning of the year too when he was debating about oh, his one-year right. salary. Yeah. And I'm... Man, like, that went to arbitration. Arbitration this year, I don't know, kind of feel like every year is kind of a joke. Like, the arbitrator literally just splits down the middle. Oh, 100%. He just, he literally finds exactly where the middle is between both the team and the player, and then he just gives them that. I, like, everyone's, like, freaking out over Mark Stone wanting 9 mil in Ottawa. Like, see, your team sucks, your team right. sucks, nobody wants to play this way, he wants 9. Like, no, man, because he's looking, they're offering 5. He's probably thinking, man, I'm a $7 million man, that's what I want. Yeah. And that's what he's going for. And so that's why he went with nine, because literally that's what the arbitrator's done with every scenario this year. Exactly. So he knows he's just going to land right on seven million right where he wants. Because I, tr- like, I think the Jets offered four, Trouba wanted seven, yeah. and then they went in the half. Yeah, and right in half. <laughs> right in half. Yeah. I was like, they do that. They've done it all this year. So I, I agree. And with the arbitration, it's kind of a joke. But... You know, like, I look at uh, Truba, who was also very dominant for the Jets this year. Yeah. And he, he took a lot of good minutes, played played really good hockey down the stretch. And yeah, uh, pretty well in the playoffs for him. Didn't put up points, but again, he's that's not really what he's there for. He's sense. more of a two-way he's, guy as well. He's a big, yeah, two-way shutdown. Mm-hmm. Like most of those Winnipeg, even they're all huge. 
And so now the big question is, what do you think will happen with Darnell Nurse because of this? Do you think it will help the Oilers cause or hurt the Oilers I cause? I think it hurts the Oilers cause. Um, Jacob Truba had two less points than Darnell Nurse did in 30 less games almost. Mm-hmm. I think that Darnell Nurse can now look at this and say like, hey, if Matthew Dumbo, who's only a year younger than me or a year older than me, I mean, he put up 25 less points, but still, I'd say now from where Nurse was at hoping for like three to four million dollars, I think that could easily, he has a bargaining chip now and he's going to use these contracts and say, hey, I want something closer to that mm-hmm. 4.5 five million dollar range somewhere in there now Mm -hmm. which i understand it's a smart use for nurse i would use these contracts too but i just think i personally would not want him to be signing that much money just because that literally takes up the rest of the weather's cap space considering they're going to be rocking four they had 4.9 million left yeah that would take (laughs) that would take up literally the rest of their cap space and yeah, and I look at them as like, man, Jacob Trub is getting paid, or not Jacob Trub, Matt, Matt Dumba, in my eyes, the best out of them. Yeah. I thought he, I think he is in my eyes, like he's more offensive than the other two and, and you know, took over uh, the playoffs last year, which once again, I know it's my third time saying it, but he was, I just can't believe how good he was in those playoffs last year. And that's what really blew me over the edge was how good he was. So for him to make six, yeah, well deserved, well learned. And then I look at Jacob Truba. A little bit less talented that I would have. Yeah, he's got the right-handed shot, and that might give him a little edge over yeah. there for the bargaining. But, you know, maybe five mils. So then I look at Darnell Nurse, who's third, and I, I agree. I'm like, man, he's a four and a half to $5 million man, according to those contracts. Absolutely. That, that'll that fall right into where it is. I'll totally understand if he does sign for that. Mm-hmm. I, I won't be surprised at this point due to those contracts if, like, if Nurse would have signed before these guys, I would have been surprised. Mm-hmm. But now that the, these are out in the open and he knows and he's going to use these as he should because any players try and get the most money that they can. Mm-hmm. Um, yeah, I, it, I did just as an like as an Oilers fan, I just think that that's yeah, unfortunately, probably going to hurt us a little bit just because that's probably that's potentially maxing out the rest of our salary cap for mm-hmm. this year. And I just wish, I hope still that it's like a three to four million bridge for like three years, like we talked about last episode. And then that's where I look at because you have Dumba who signed for a five year deal and got paid six. And then you have Trubu who signed for a one year deal and gets five and a half. Right. So where would that put you for your nurse? Like, how mine is like the other thing is how much term does he want? Because I was all for a bridge deal at two years three to four mil yep. and then if he's gonna you know get what he's earned on comparable to these guys you know if if he's signing for four and a half to five in my eyes he's got to sign for three four years at that 100 where i uh i think that uh i don't know i just love the bridge deal so much like i look at and it's the best case that i've seen of a bridge deal but was the pk suban deal the goal yeah. proved me for five. I think he made five and a half, and then he went and won the Norris. Then boom, gets a big payday. Exactly. And I love the bridge. He was like, "Show me what you're worth. Go out there and prove to me, Darnell. Like you have a tons of potential. Like the guy flies out there. He hits. He fights. He leads the rushes. Yeah, he he plays them. smart. Yeah. He hits. Like he just does everything so good. And then you'll just get glimpses of it. And he still has that potential. He's still super young. Yeah. Like the guy He's is only 23 years old. 23. Yeah, 20, and, 23 years old, 6'4", 213 pounds. Yeah. Like, and, he's not a small kid either. No, and he's played three years in the NHL. Yeah. Like, and I just think, like, I just, like, he's just on a silver line. Like, he is going to be just such a stud. We get little glimpses all the time. And I just would love that bridge deal with him. Just, I, I think that works well for him, too. Because, obviously, if he, if he tries to get as much money as he can, I, I don't blame him. Mm-hmm. But that works so well that he has so much potential now. If it's a three- to four-year bridge deal, that sets him out. Like I said last time with, with other guys doing the bridge with, like, Strom, it gives you three to four years to really elevate your game. And then you're sitting at 27, which is basically the peak for most NHL guys. Mm-hmm. You can sign at 27. As long as he keeps, like, some consistent numbers um, it- through the next few years, then come around the three or four year mark from now, mm-hmm. and he's 27 years old, he can absolutely rake in a huge contract at that point. And then here's something just gonna butt in there, is if he signs a three year deal, uh, Andre Secker will be coming off his five and a half million dollar hit, he'll be 35, yep. and so I just look at it like, hey man, like you now have a pool of $10 million to choose from, That's instead so of like the four. So if I was him, 
I would be signing a three year, four to four and a half million dollar deal right now. Yeah. Help out your team, give them a little bit of cap space you can help out with and be like, and then next time when it comes up to that, like, hey, there's an extra five and a half million dollars on the table because Andre Secker left. I gave you guys a little bit of money back. Yep. Now you get now it's your turn to pay me. Help me out a little because I helped you. But at the end of the day, that's just how I look at it. We also that is a really good point to bring up there. That last contract season with Sekra. That's also the last year of uh, Chris Russell too. Man, so, we have him that long. Oh well. So the same <laughs> year that Sekra ends, uh, the same year Chris Russell will be ending. So he'll be 34, 35 at that point. So there's another four million dollars. So that'll be nine point five million dollars you'll have. Mm-hmm. Hopefully, Evan Bouchard will have came in, come in to fill the hole of when Secker is gone or Russell to fill one of those D roles. Not saying they're going to be the same player, but fill one of those roles. Mm-hmm. And then you have then at least you'll have at that point the money to pay for Nurse if he really does get to that elite level. Yep. Then it's like perfect. We have nine million dollars that we just opened up in in just defense mm-hmm. that we can pay him. I think that would work out perfectly. Mm-hmm. Actually, so, and that's actually interesting too. I always forget Russell's getting paid four million dollars. Mm-hmm. Because would you say that Darnell Nurse is better D man than Chris Russell? Uh yes. No, oh, hands down. Yeah. Hands down. I don't even know why yeah. I paused. Yeah. <laughs> it's yeah. like, it's it, it, I agree one hundred percent that he's. They have, they have different styles. styles. Yeah, like, very different styles. Like uh, I know a lot of people when Chris Russell signed, they were mad. Uh, about the player, they're like, oh, he blocks shot, flops around like fish, does this. Man, Chris Russell, a, he's a good defenseman. I really like, like him. I love it. Like, he has great outside passes, plays hard defensively, block shots, good PK. Like, he does his job so good. He's the only a perfect th- defensive defenseman. Yeah, like, he is awesome at what he does. The only thing that I didn't like about when we signed Chris Russell, and it's nothing against Chris Russell, but he was just a left handed defenseman. Yeah. And I looked at the Oilers, we had Nurse, Sakura, Clefbaum. And then we signed, re-signed Chris Russell. I was like, oh, I really wanted a righty. And exactly. I thought for four million plus a little bit, say coming out of the, coming out of what we had a couple years ago, I thought you could have gotten a decent right-handed defenseman. We could have shot for one, even though we don't have Taylor Hall trade for Adam Larson again. But yeah. I was like, you could have shopped out something. And that was the only thing against Chris Russell. But then I look at the Chris Russell signing at four. You can argue that, hey, Chris Russell makes four. I make 4.5. Exactly. Know? Again, that's just going to be another tool, which I always forget about Chris Russell as to why Darnell Nurse is going to be able to sign now for even a little bit more. He goes, he can easily say that, yeah, I bring a different skill set than Chris Russell does to the table. But in the end of the day, if you had to choose one or the other, obviously you're going to take Darnell Nurse. So he can absolutely go and say, hey, I'm, I'm at least wanting to start off here. If we're starting the bidding, I'm going at 4.5 then. If I'm darting on there to Peter Schroeder, the Edmonton Oilers, I would say I'm starting at 4.5 at my lowest. If, if you're yeah. comparing it to other. Yeah. Other, but then at the same time, you look at Oscar Clefbaum, who again is on a good deal. He's at 4.1. Adam Larson, 4.1. So they can counter and be like, hey, nurse, don't forget, like our top two pair mm-hmm. are only making 4.1. So what, what leads you to say that you should be making... X number of dollars more than them, right? Yeah. I just wish they would sign so we'd have something cool to talk about because right now we're talking so hypothetical. I know, and it's, it's just, oh, it's so it's going to be so interesting. God, it's got to be soon. you got to think. It's got to be soon that they're going to sign him. Yeah, because like, my, at the end of the day, like, if, if, I was a, if I was a player, like, yeah, like, they have every right to use that um, uh, the arbitrator. And I think, you know, like, that's part of your tool. Like, if it's part of your agreement, then go ahead and use it. Like, I, I have no ill will to guys that ever want to use that because... A lot of fans that you read, like, it's just, like, oh, one arbitration, you know, like, unhappy with this. are like, no, like, you're arguing for your contract. Like, it, these are millions of dollars. It's a business. Like, mm-hmm. that's part of being in the NHL and the whole organization, this huge multi-million dollar company. you got to... Yeah. The players should be pushing for as much as they want. Mm-hmm. Like, as as crappy it is, as sometimes as a, on, a, on the fan side of it, mm-hmm. to say, oh, my God, we're using so much cap on this guy. And then the day, like, reverse the situation if you were there... Yeah, two three million dollars. I know that they're already making tons, but that's that's still a lot of money that you're. Tons of money. That I, so I, I will never blame a guy for looking at it, the hockey side of it as a player side. One hundred percent. Get as much as you can. Why wouldn't you? Mm-hmm. I just look at arbitration. The thing I'm always worried about is just I just can't see arbitration being fun. Like here's your horrible. team that's shooting for you. That's like man, 
Darnell, you're the best. You're you're gonna you're an up and coming prospect. Then you get it to that table, and they're gonna have to you know pitch against you. Like man, he hasn't proven it yet. He's only had you know twenty some or twenty three points last year. Uh, he's not really pulling his weight. Like it just you know he's not the guy we thought he was going to be. And I just look at that sometimes like man like. Do you really want to go into that for a couple hundred thousand? That's very true. That's, that's <laughs> uh, I, I'm glad you brought that up. It's such an interesting dynamic because on the Spit and Chippets podcast last week, mm-hmm. they had Joel Edmondson on who just went uh, through the arbitration thing, mm-hmm. or he was going to go through the arbitration thing prior uh, when he was on the podcast, and he talked about um, how they how they asked him. So you're basically going to go into a courtroom where two weeks ago. Your manager and your head coach and everyone was like, yeah, we really want you here. We want you to re-sign. Mm-hmm. You're one of our up-and-coming guys. And then two weeks later, they go in the courtroom and, and just basically, they have to throw your name in the dirt mm-hmm. so that they get their side of it. It's it's such an interesting dynamic because then you're just like, God, is that going to start to ruin like some relationships? And Joel Edmondson, Edmondson said that he got brought into the head office prior to that going on. And they mm-hmm. kind of just sat him down and be like, you know what's going to come from this? We totally understand your side of it, but we just don't want this to ruin our relationship going forward. Mm -hmm. We don't want you to be bitter against our franchise or anything like that. You have to understand this is the business. This is what's going to come. Well, that's what the GM gets paid money for. Like if I'm an owner, I'm paying the GM to save me money, get me the best team that he can with uh, his salary cap. Exactly. And so he has to do his job. Just as the players have to do their their job. So it's like you can't be upset, but I just look at it not being a fun thing. It'd be horrible. And I don't... (laughs) I don't think anybody wants to go to that point if they don't have to, but I mean, if you're going to stick by your guns and want to make the money, I totally understand why mm-hmm. you go that route. It just sucks because I could totally see if a team doesn't bring the guy in before arbitration and sit them down like they did with uh, with Joel and say, hey, this is what's going to happen kind of thing. Like, just remember that we, we still want you here no matter what happens in that courtroom. We're not going to, we don't want to part ways with you. We don't think you're crappy or anything like that. But I feel like if some if some teams didn't do that with guys just walked in that courtroom and absolutely threw their name through the dirt, said how oh, you're just a crappy guy, you didn't turn out to what we wanted you to be, blah 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 blah. And then, <laughs> and then like, this this player walks out of the courtroom saying, "Well, screw these guys." Like, I I, I, I would understand them for being salty. Then like, mm-hmm. I totally get it. So, oh yeah, arbitration just sounds brutal. It does. It sounds brutal. It's a tool that I like that everybody gets to use and. I just think it just wouldn't be that fun to be a part of where I'd be like, man, like, and once again, like you said, the player, like, I don't know Darnell, but like, you know, hopefully he has a good confidence in himself and they talk him down, right? But like, you get a person who's, you know, has like more of a fragile self-awareness and, you know, your mind plays tricks on you and you just dwell on stuff. And yeah, like maybe you're not as, you know, confident as you'd like to believe. Exactly. So So then, yeah. So then this happens in July or now, or now in August and then. You go in, you see you have a month or so, and then training camp starts, and you're just like, you just double think. You're, you're always second guessing now. Maybe that one comment that the head coach makes to you on the bench, and they're just like, hey, pick it up, and they're like, yeah. You just think about back to that courtroom when they were just like, yeah, trash. Yeah, yeah. And you're just like, oh, God, maybe they do think I'm crap, kind mm-hmm. of thing. But yeah, so all in all, I don't think these signings of these other defensemen help the Oilers' case. On the, on the uh, salary cap side of it, mm-hmm. it's definitely good for Darnell Nurse, and I, I hope he gets. A good payday because I think he does deserve it. However, I just my final thoughts are is I just hope that they do not use the four point nine million dollars that they have left for him, which I feel like they potentially might. So that's why I feel like it might end up being a four point five. I agree. Uh, I want to let uh, my one stud of the day go to Darnell Nurse. He's nice. the he's the stud of the day. Swipe his one stud, stud of the day. One stud of the day and. Uh, yeah, like he has everything so good. He's so fast. He, I just love him as a player, and I really want him to stay as an Oiler. And I think you know, as long as I just want him to sign between four to four and a half, and I think I, that'd be fair. And a three-year deal, I would love it, and just be like, point out the stuff we did. Like, hey man, look how much space we got coming up. Go prove it. Go out there, be the best you can. Develop how we want you to. Develop how the faith that we believe that you can. And he will, and this guy will just, he'll be money. Like, he just, everything he does, he does so good. Like, he comes in 10 points, 11 points, and then 26 points. Like, he's always improving. He plays a style of game with that, once he gets used to it, like, he reminds me of kind of like a poor man's Duncan Keith in my eyes. Like, he just passes, just does everything so good, and he's so fast, and he skates so smooth. And I think that he, you give him a couple of years and he develops properly, you will have a poor man's Duncan Keith out there. Yeah, I can see that. Mm-hmm. And, and I think th- one last thing, I just remember when they were going to be drafting him, 
or they were, Edmonton was looking to be around the spot where he was going to go, mm-hmm. and they did a good like uh, in depth thing about him when he was playing for Shattuck or uh, Sue Saint Marie, and how this kid had such a good work ethic. Mm-hmm. He was always in the gym. You know, he isn't he's a jack by any means. Like he's very fit, but he's a like, very dangly kind of guy. Yeah. Especially when he was eighteen, going to the draft. But they but they said the kid works so hard. He's always in the gym, doing the weights, doing the cardio, every all the off ice stuff. And I think you can see that that's transpired into his NHL career. So I think that I don't think that's a work ethic that's ever going to leave him. No. So I think that's why he's safe. He's safe that if we do pay a little extra sure. for him, I think it'll it's still going to work out. Exactly. Like he's not like one of those free agent guys where you know they're coming they're coming off a hot year and you're going to sign him for something, regret a couple years down the road. Like there's nothing but the ceiling for Darnell Nurse. Yeah. Nothing, and he's gonna he's gonna prove that and. I thought he, t- he was like one of my only favorite, not my only favorite, that's a hard stretch, but he's like one of the shining things from last year. I thought he looked dominant, awesome out there. And you know, the Oilers were so bad last year that he was like the one good area to look at that maybe when the Oilers do pick it up this year, which I honestly do believe they will, you'll see a huge boost in points. I honestly think he will probably get 30 to 40 points as you're calling it right now. I was saying 37 points for you know going i'm doing arbitration splitting down the middle between 35 and 40 (laughs) and that's what he's gonna get and i think he's gonna he's gonna just play lights out this next year so i hope he resigns hope he makes it soon hopefully no hard feelings are done and i just can't wait to see him again next year couldn't agree more i think it's gonna be awesome so hopefully by the time the next podcast comes around we have something uh assigned to talk about (laughs) and so now i think we're gonna move into some line combinations yes um the Oilers Nation put out a really good article of uh, the line combination extravaganza. Uh, they went through, I think, four or five scenarios of just completely random different um, different line combinations. So we can kind of go through those, um, yeah. pick them apart, and then at the end you can, we'll both kind of just say the line combination that we would like to see ourselves yeah. going into the season. So looking at scenario one here, Oilers Nation, um, it says... Uh, this is the scenario in which they completely load up the top line. So that's your big three. You got Nuge on the wing, McDavid, Drysaddle, followed up by Ryder, Strom, Puliarvi. The nice thing there is that they have in the second line. Mm-hmm. Uh, Lucic, Brodziak, <laughs> Kajula, and then Jujar, Kara, Marudi, and Kazian. And then Aberg is your mm-hmm. um, extra. I, I, I hate it. I, 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 they, even, they, even put, they put on here that the likeliness of this is 0 out of 10. I, I, you can't upload your top line like that. No. Uh, it's like if we learned something from the decade of darkness when we had Nuge, Hall, and Eberle. Like, yeah, the top line was fun to play with. Yeah. And, but then after that, it went downhill so fast. So quick. So, no, I, uh, I love uh, the Pittsburgh Penguins model where they have uh, Crosby and Melks, you know, uploading the two lines and having Phil Kessel on the third line. Yeah. I love that. Three lines coming at you. So to upload your one top line... Can you get a big old zero for me? Yeah. That's uh, just me. That's going to be an F in my books as well. <laughs> I, I don't see this happening. I, and I, I don't think they did either. They're just throwing out scenarios. Mm-hmm. Um, the only time I can see those three guys playing together would be a stacked up power play. Mm-hmm. Scenario two, uh, which brings the wealth down the middle um, strategy, which a lot of people talk about with the others. Yeah. Uh, that goes down the middle. This is McDavid, dry side, Nuge on the third line. Wingers for McDavid, a rider, and Rowdy, which is interesting. Um, dry Saddles wingers would be Lucic and Strong, and Nuge would have Puli RV and uh, Jujar Kara. And then rounding out the uh, fourth line, which I actually do like this fourth line uh, Kajula, Brodzia, Cassian. That's a strong fourth line, but I don't think uh, Kajula should be buried that low. I would, I would like that. You just got to make a couple switches. Um, for me, I would uh, switch Ryan Strong with Jesse Puli RV, and then I would switch, uh, I'd make uh, Jujar Kara uh, play with. Uh, Nijer Hopkins and I'd have uh, Ryder playing with uh, his German brother and Leon there. Yeah. And the only thing that I have a little issue is I find a lot of people in putting Ty Ratty just with McDavid just because they played good for 12 games with each other. Yeah. Where I'm like, man, like, uh, nothing is Ty Ratty. I think he's played really good, but he's been playing with freaking Connor McDavid. Like, That's, he put a lot of people out there and he's going to get a lot of points. I think they did a segment recently on, uh, it was TSN, and it was uh, that Mike Johnson talking about it. Yeah. And they compared a lot of guys' points when they play with McDavid, and it's night and day. I think Ty Ratty literally, the for the games that he played with McDavid, that's where he got all of his points. I think he had one point mm-hmm. outside of playing with McDavid. Mm-hmm. So I think you're right. It is very hard for people to 
always be putting him there just assuming that he's going to do well. I mean, that's the thing. Anyone's going to do well mm-hmm. there. So I, he, in my mind, Raddy isn't proven in the sense that he hasn't proven himself on like playing with dry side on it, line or Nuge. No, like I look at Nuge and McDavid, they played lights out at uh, the World Championships this year. They played good together. I like those two together. Like that for me, I'd pen those in. And I would just pencil tie Raddy in right now. Like I think Kaylee Armoto, Yessi Puliyarvi, Drake Kajula. You know, I wouldn't like Drake Kajula up there just because I felt like he's had his chance up there. And I, I like, like so too. And I think he's he's more of a third line grinder. Like he likes to hit. I love when he hits. When he hits, he's that much more effective in his game. And especially for his size too, he hits very well for him not being like one of the bigger guys. No. On the team, let alone in the NHL. Yeah, and so um, I, I like the three line depth. And calling it right now to TSN, Sportsnet, whoever. <laughs> Even considers putting uh, Toronto's Matthews Tavares better than the Oilers. You're wrong. You're dead wrong. It's not even a discussion. Drop it. Like I, you take Connor McDavid and Leon Draisaitl every day over those two. The only one that I would still have better is I still like uh, Sid the Kid and Melks better than those two. But once again, you are looking at like it's just those two are so like close in between. Like you can argue. McDavid might be a little better than Crosby. You can argue that Crosby might be a little better than McDavid. And I think mine is just Melks is better than Drysdale for right now. Yeah, for right now because and Melks has proven that he's been a solid player for long. But and you can see Drysdale hopefully taking that same trend that he did. But I agree with that, especially for right now. Um, we I think it would be more justifiable to have Toronto ahead of Edmonton after this year if <laughs> if that's a, if. Mm-hmm. If the Toronto combo does a lot better than Edmonton, but right now I think if you're just looking at a bare bones, especially with with Matthews and Tavares never being on the same team, mm-hmm. I don't see how you can put them ahead right now. And and who would you just sorry for interrupting? Just who would you have better? Would you have Ma, uh, McDavid or Tavares? Who would you have better? Oh, McDavid. No, no question. Okay. Yeah, and, and then, then I think almost everybody would answer that same question. Oh, no question. So like and then the only counter to that would be: Would you have Drysdale or Matthews? And trick stat of the day. Leon Dreisaitl has never been outscored by Austin Matthews in a single season. So there you go. So it's like, so boom, there's your argument, TSN. Drop it with the whole Toronto's better. Just don't even mention it anymore. But um, for the line combos, I really like spreading out the wealth. Uh, And yeah, I like that line combo a lot. However, I thought Ryan Strom at the end of the year last year proved that he could be a third line centerman. And I, and I felt he looked so good. Like, at the beginning of the year, I felt he looked a little off. He didn't look like he was himself. And then, honestly, it was about, like, it was a halfway through point where he played in Boston, played with Leon Dreisaitl, when Todd McClellan finally split up McDavid and Leon, because I've been calling for that all at the beginning of the year. I hated it. You were too front heavy on those guys. It needed to show that Leon was worth his 8.5 without McDavid, which he is. And he can carry a line he on can, his own. He could carry a line. That guy could carry a line on his own. I don't care who says he can't. That guy could carry a line on his own as he proved it last year. However, um, back to my point, is that's when Strom, around that time, lit it up where he had the nicest bar down goal. Like that thing, you could, when he scored it, you could hear the Edmonton from Boston. Like that was how loud it was. And I thought after that moment, Ryan Strom looked like he was finally becoming himself. And I think think he's going to turn some heads this year. I think he's going to prove that he's worth it. I know I've been, everybody that uh, we were talking about for the Oilers are like, oh, I think he's going to turn around, turn around. Yeah, Yeah, but I think the Oilers are going to turn around this year. Maybe they'll have a regardless, I think they'll have a turnaround season. I think uh, I don't think Strom will take massive strides. I don't think he's going to be jumping up like thirty points, but I think oh. like a ten to twenty point jump would be perfect. Oh, I, I can see it happening. It's realistic. Mm-hmm. So moving on now, we're going to be scenario three with uh, the Oilers Nation, in, uh, in which Puliyarvi plays on his off wing. Uh, so this is the lines. This first line, I'm liking uh, a mm-hmm. little bit more. This is kind of closer to what I would do. You got Nugent Hopkins on the left, McDavid on the middle, and Raddy on the right. Mm-hmm. Second line, you got Puliyarvi on his off wing on the left with Drysaddle in the middle and Ryder on the right. Okay. Again, I like that Drysaddle uh, Ryder um, combo from uh, Team Europe a mm-hmm. couple, couple years ago. Third line, you got Lu- uh, Lucic, Strom, Kajula. Fourth line, you got Kara, Brodzia, Cassian. I like that. I like that combo a lot. That is the most interesting one. Like it would be hands down your like NHL nineteen player setup. Yeah. Um, just because it sounds so fun. Um, my only thing is, I just I I really think Lee, Milan Lucic will take a step forward this year. But it's just where do you put him? Where would you like to see him succeed? 
I think just due to the respect that you have for the guy that he has had so many good seasons other than last year, mm-hmm. that you can't just base it off one season and throw the guy third, fourth line. In my mind, I would be keeping him on the second line, at least mm-hmm. for the start, just to see where he's at, mm-hmm. see what he's going to bring to the table for the first quarter bit of the season, mm-hmm. see if he can bring elevate his game to where he used to be. Mm-hmm. I still think you give him the benefit of the doubt just because he's proven himself for quite a few seasons now in the NHL that he can be mm-hmm. a top guy. Well, like at the end of the year last year, for or so I mean at the end of the year, like it, technically it was the end of the year, 2017. But at the end of 2017, he was on pace still at Christmas for 55 points. Yeah. And nobody would have complained. And then he went on literally the worst streak of his life by one goal in 39 games. Exactly. Like, he, there is something mentally with him. There's something mental with the team. Uh, I think just like people were like, oh, the lines were, you know, like McDavid wasn't sure he was a good leader. There was, you know, issues in the dressing room. I think the issue in the dressing room, they came in there too cocky. Absolutely. Like yeah. uh, like Patrick Maroon said on that Spit Chicklets podcast a couple weeks ago, mm-hmm. the guys just came in and they just thought it was just going to be too, like, easy. They just thought it was going to come to them this year. Just because mm-hmm. Bags had them second in odds to win the Stanley Cup, they just thought, oh, well, we're just going to roll in here and be a good team. Everyone's going to lay over for us. Mm-hmm. And then they quickly realized how much hard work they had to put in the prior season to get to where they were, to battle the playoffs, to get to the second round. Mm-hmm. And they came to realize that very quick, but it might have almost, almost not been soon enough because it slipped away from them so quick. Mm-hmm. Where you knew, like, you had faith that if, if it was a huge turnaround, they could come back mm-hmm. at the halfway point of the season. But you're like, if they're staying on this trend right now where they were, there is no hope. And then, like, the other cool thing I always love about the NHL is they show at the American Thanksgiving, which I'm sorry for my, our American people. I don't know what day that is. But by American Thanksgiving. Sometime in November. Sometime in November. It's usually like a month and a half into the season. Yeah. The, how the standings are usually go is if you made it to the playoffs, you in by then, you usually stuck into the playoffs. Yeah. There's, I forget what it was. It was like 83% chance. If you made it in by uh, New Thanksgiving, me, then you've made it in for the rest of the year. Yeah. Which is crazy. Like you're, a year, you're a month and a half in. And you can already kind of like give a good, good impression of what's going down. So that shows that they got to call the gate hot. And, uh, and so I just really want to see Luch on the second line. Um, the biggest question I have for our lineups right now so far in the trend is I'm seeing is A, does Ty Raddy get top line spots just automatically. And then the other thing is B, where do you have Kayla Yamamoto? If he does come in, like, I don't pencil him into the Oilers lineup. I like development. However, if he comes in there and steals a spot, he stole a spot. I agree. He is, he is all, it's all on him to take a spot this year. Mm -hmm. It's there for him as long as he plays well. Like you said, it's not, it's not going to be a given to him. But he's also not going to be just put to the wayside and say that he doesn't have a chance. Mm-hmm. It's all on his shoulders coming into this camp for him to make this squad. Yeah, because I like, uh, I think the Oilers like their center depth is the best in the league. Yeah, we already mentioned that. Uh, but I, you know, like our right side, it's you know, it's a little soft. It could go a little bit better. Like, uh, it, but it all depends on how players react. Like you have Yessi Puliyarvi, who I think is going to have a good year this year, and. Does Kelly Yamamoto step up? Like, he played that, um, they had that tournament where Emma Bouchard was at. He was at, I don't know if it's like the Young Guns thing, but it was like the Warriors prospects versus each other. And just watching that, like, Kelly Yamamoto was hands down the best prospect at that thing. He looked great. Okay. Like, he looked like a man among boys, uh, head on a swivel, made passes, made plays. Like, there wasn't one time that you just didn't notice the little guy out there. Exactly. And so I think that if he carries that, and he, like, went to the corners, got pucks, took hits, pass, shot, like, he was fantastic out there. And so, yeah, he could come in and steal a spot. And so those are my big two questions so far what we came through with the lines. I think the big thing with giving Raddy that first line spot is all going to be dependent on um, preseason. Mm-hmm. I know that you're not going to throw McDavid in for the full preseason, obviously. Mm-hmm. But you got he'll be playing at least for the last five games or so, mm-hmm. five, six games. So that's when you... You throw in Ratty for a little bit. You mm-hmm. throw in Yamamoto for a little bit. You throw in Puliyarvi for a little bit. You try everything. You exhaust all your options mm-hmm. in preseason, and then you can sit back before the regular season starts and be like, okay, we have all this film, we have all these stats on all these guys. Who's going to go where opening night? Mm-hmm. <coughs> and yeah, I I agree. And we gotta, you know, it sucks. We gotta see it in uh, Germany this year. Germany or Sweden when we start on the road this year. So Germany, back Germany home for dry saddle. Yeah. But yeah, so I think that's where it's gonna be for that. Um, 
we can go over kind of the lines that we would personally like now mm -hmm. to get into that. I would. And so um, let's go over top line. Who would you like to see for your top line? My uh, top line right now is one of the ones that we went over. Um, Nugent Hopkins on the left, McDavid on the middle. And right now I'm just putting Raddy on the right. Yep. We'll just say that um, just for argument's sake or whatever that he's there right now. Mm -hmm. For myself, uh, I would agree. Uh, Nuge, McDavid, but I'm throwing in Kilian Moto for right now, just because the only thing that I don't like is last year, uh, McClellan did the slots. He had Mike Camilleri there at the end of the year at the power play minutes. And I was like, why are you putting a guy that's not going to resign with us, that's old, that you know doesn't need this time? Like, these games are pretty much worthless at the well, end of the year. We're already basically We're out of it. Why not give some other guys a couple shots? Yeah, like, give, like, uh, Pugliarvi. I know Yamamoto wasn't with the team at the end last year, but give Pugliarvi some time. Right. So I just feel like I just hope that they give it to one of the young bucks. Like, give it to them, like, Pooley Arby or him. Personally, for myself, I'd love to see Kelly Amoto up there because uh, he goes skill versus skill. But, uh, you know, having Pooley Arby up there with some size could help out too. So, I, mine would be, uh, for right now, I uh, would love to have Kelly Amoto up there. And then if he doesn't make the team, then i got to go with Ty Ratty. Go, like, with the whole uh, Connor Sheary uh, with... Uh, with Crosby out there, get you know a nice cheap winger. Well, and exactly, then, and, and he, Raddy's a big shooter. That's the mm -hmm. biggest part of his game is he's a goal scorer. Not saying that uh, Yamamoto's not, but Yamamoto I feel like has more of a passing, dangling. He's got a lot of speed mm -hmm. to his game, whereas mm -hmm. Raddy's the big. You find that guy in the slot, he's probably going to score. Mm -hmm. That's the thing I like about Raddy, but that's also very comparable with Puli Arby. Puli mm -hmm. Arby's also a big kid, natural scorer. He's an absolute cannon of a shot and a wrist shot and everything mm -hmm. like that. So I, he's interchangeable for me, putting Puli Arby there. Mm -hmm. I'm not sold on Yamamoto yet. I, mm -hmm. I think he's great and everything. I just want to see how he does coming into training camp. Yep. And I, you just got to work for that top spot. He mm -hmm. does. He can deserve a spot on the team. It'll just be, he'd have to work really hard for a top spot. I agree. Moving on to the second line now. Uh, I have Lucic on the left, Drysdale up the middle, and then Puli Arby on the right wing. Again, mm -hmm. you can interchange that with Rowdy and Puli Arby, but that's my second line. That is mine too. They played it a little bit last year like that. Um, we went and saw them uh, versus the Kings last year, and man, in March, and I love that line. Yeah, uh, Lucic was playing terrible hockey, but there were these three giants. I was just going to say, look at the size of that <laughs> line. Like, the smallest guy is Dreisen on 6'3", I think. Yeah. And Lucic at 6'4", and Pugliarvi also at 6'3". Those are three big boys. Mm -hmm. they, it doesn't matter who goes in for that first puck to dig in the corner because it's a big body regardless. Mm -hmm. And then, oh, I would love to see. That's, that's just a big intimidating second line mm -hmm. that has like Bully Arby's the one with the big speed on that line drives out just saw he can dominate that puck mm -hmm. he can hold a guy off with one arm and control the puck with the other and then Lucic could just absolutely bang bodies in stand in front of the net basically bang some goals away yeah the only, the only thing that I'm concerned about with that line is Tobias Reader like did Drysaddle talk to management like have like an inner deal like hey I want to play with my German brother you know put me with him um, see what the deal is there. That's the only um, comparable right there that I see that could be changed is Tobias Reader going in there because that was part of the deal. Maybe the draw so I was like, give me this guy because he didn't really give me anybody last year. You know, like that could be it. So that would be my only thing for anybody that wants to argue about that is Tobias Reader could find a spot there. I can totally see that and I think they're really going to um, expose that in the uh, preseason. They're really going to test that out to see if there is that chemistry between Dry side on Ryder, mm -hmm. and if there is, then I think definitely Ryder um, can be pushed up to that second spot. Mm -hmm. So my third line now, I got Kajula on the left wing, Strom up the middle, and Ryder on the right. Yeah, I got that too. Do you? Yeah. <laughs> hey, just saying, we didn't talk about well, these this... lines prior. We just did them ourselves to see. Yeah. And then uh, my fourth line is Jujar Kara, Kyle Bronziak, and Zach Cassian. That's fine. Yeah. Which I love, love that fourth line. That's fourth line. I think that's great. Well, Kyle Bronziak, strong centerman, Zach Cassian. He's buried quite low in this lineup, but I, st I love Zach. You could put him up on that third line. I'd be mm -hmm. fine with that. Mm -hmm. Like, if he's if he's absolutely on fire, I could see him getting pushed to second line. I really like Zach Cassidy. He has such underrated speed. Oh. He's got great shot. He doesn't always finish sometimes. I know he got lots of breakaways it's last year. And he messed up <laughs> on quite a few, but I really like Zach Cassidy. And I, I think I, I also sucker for his story, his turnaround story with rehab and everything like that, where he's, where he's made himself. And mm -hmm. how he always said Edmonton was his last chance that he knew he had to really make it right. And I think he has. Uh, Drew Darker had a great season last year. He's a big body. Yep, Drew Darker was one of my highlights from and last yeah, year. And yeah, there's Kyle Brodziak again. a solid guy. I already played for Edmonton. Great centerman. So he's fine on that fourth line. Yeah, like Zach Cassian, um, 
to me, last year took a big step back in my eyes. I loved Compared to the prior season, team? absolutely. Like, uh, Zach's got to go in there. He's got to use his speed, use his hitting, and fight somebody. Absolutely. And, man, when... Uh, he's a scary guy out there. He's got to use that. Man, he's got the most intimidating eyes in the league. Exactly. Like, he like has... He's a psychopath. So, like, like, he's awesome. He's like, got to use that. When he took out uh, Albrecht and Larson a couple of year, or two years ago, and then punched Duclair, and then Shane Doan had to go in there and wrestle him down. And like, him and uh, Taylor Hall. Taylor yeah, Hall. Like, man, him, like, he's yeah. just... He doesn't have all the screws there. I love Zach Cassian. He did him six years ago when he... You know, one hand broke a uh, Sam Gagne's jaw, but I love him now that he plays with us. And I, I just think that those forward lines are awesome. And then, do you want to go through the D really quick here? Absolutely. I got uh, Clef Baum Larson. It's my top pair. Yep. Uh, then I got Nurse Sekra. Dude, okay, we can't all have the same lines. <laughs> Next time we will go over them and just have them different. And then I got Benning Russell. Yeah, I mine is. Uh, I love, um, they had Darnell Nurse and Larson for a bit last year, and I really like, but I just have Nurse, who's going to be playing with Sekra, and then as soon for next year, year afterwards, though, I'm having Sekra third line, yep. and I'm having Nurse and Evan Bouchard there. Absolutely, because there's, again, a left, right, and I think uh, Sekra, he's an older guy in the league, he's been around for a little bit, hopefully he can, like, mm-hmm. be a good little mentor on the same line mm-hmm. as uh, Nurse, they can kind of, you know, build oh. that, build that, like, veteran newer guy into the league kind of dynamic with each other and Sekker can really help him advance take those next few steps after his contract signing if that ever happens yeah and, and I love and I love Andre Sekker I feel like he is a guy last year that the Oilers at the beginning when they were with him that was the biggest hole they had they did not fill up that hole and when he came back I felt like he was rushed and looked like himself and I honestly expect big things next year from Andre Sekker because you look at his numbers he always has about 30 points up every year good plus minus he is a stud of a defense. Stud of a defense. Hey, he's a second stud of the day, and uh, he's so good. And I just really feel like he needs to, you know, come in there, be good because the Oilers really needed him last year. I think so, and I think he was rushed because the Oilers were panicking because they realized that the like, kingdom was falling around them at the point. We need somebody right now, mm-hmm. and I think he might have gotten rushed, and that's why he didn't look the same. And then getting that that uh, third uh, pairing there, Benning Russell, I like that. Um, I think that's a perfect spot for Benning still. Mm-hmm. Still, he can develop on that third line. Mm-hmm. Um, hopefully, he can make some strides. And then Russell, he's so he's very safe mm-hmm. as a as a third pairing D. You know, you can put him out there in multiple different situations: defensive zone draws, offensive zone draws. So I really like that uh, with the, those uh, the pairing D. Yeah, and mine is just next year. I hope for the Oilers. Like the biggest thing I I hated last year, what uh, Todd McClellan did. Uh, was he was so stubborn on some guys being together, like uh, McDavid, Drysidle, and then he'd give, like, you know, nine games for, you know, uh, Pulley Army on the top line. That didn't work. Then he switched something out, switched something out, and he just constantly kept changing, changing lines where it's like, man, like, how do you expect Jesse Pulley Army to play well last year at the beginning of the year when he played him with Lucic, Strom, and himself? When Strom wasn't playing very good, and uh, Lucic during, uh, after his little str- strides there, like, he wasn't playing good at all. So it's like, exactly. man, you need to hook a guy up. And I just want to see him. I just hope that he doesn't uh, mumble the lines around as much. Like, like, have a little consistency for five games or exactly. ten games and then switch it up. Like, switch it up. Give your young guy some time. And I hope with the new coaching staff they do that because the coaching last year was just one of the worst parts I thought that we had was he just mumble jumbled everything. He didn't keep the power play lines good like he had. Too many left-handed shots out there. Never gave Pulley Arby top line. And for a guy with a bomb, yeah. it's like, dude, he's one of your right-handed bombs out there. And like, that's the thing with with Todd is how he did that is it was either mixing lines up like mid-game, mm-hmm. game to game, mm-hmm. or he was just too stubborn mm-hmm. where he would keep guys for way too long together. Yeah, like It was never a happy medium, mm-hmm. like you said, where five, ten games, okay, this isn't working, let's switch it up. Rather than one game, oh, it's not working, we're switching it. Or, oh, it's going to work eventually, it's going to work eventually. 20 games in, it's like, oh, you got to try something else. Yeah, like Mark Letescu, guess what? Yeah, he did good the year before, but last year at the beginning, wasn't doing this good on the power play. Put him pulling Arby. That one he kept for like, Way too, too long. Way too long. Where it's like, hey, like putting the guy that could shoot. I'm sorry, you're playing with dry, you're playing with McDavid and Drysaddle on the power play. You're gonna get you're a lot of opportunities. Three. So it's like, give it to your best shot. And, exactly. and nothing against Mark Petrescu. I think uh, the guys at Beauty played awesome for us. I hope the best thing in life for him. However, when you have Jesse Pugliarvi sitting on the bench, missing valuable power play, and, and then not getting even an opportunity. Then it's like, dude, like, what are you doing with your life? So I just hope they have a little more consistency with their thing. I was kind of mad at the coaching last year. So I just hope with the Lions, they try to stick stuff out a little bit better. 
and not be so stubborn with some guys in some positions. I agree with that. And this is our last little piece here. I was going to ask Swites this question. I didn't tell him it prior so that he had it. Didn't just want to catch him off the spot a little bit. Not the, not a major question or anything, but if the Oilers do have another crappy season comparable to what they had last year, <clears throat> and we won't go into any specifics of like if it was whose fault, but who would you fire first, McClellan or Shirelli? Um, <laughs> gosh, that's a hard one. Um, for me, it's got to be the coach. I feel like the GM, like, Trilly, like, as much as Trilly gets on crap for his stuff, he has assembled a really good team. Like, you look at the defense core before to what it is now. It's night and day difference. You have a team where you have wicked center depth. You have big skilled bodies. You have, yeah, you have everything that I felt like Trilly gave you the tools, and he just didn't come through with it. And mine is, like, you talk about Milan Lucic. Milan Lucic was, like, the second most desired free agent behind... Uh, Steven Stamkos when he got signed and he's done nothing and you look at your coach for that and yeah I could hear people are like oh who's gonna who's better than Todd McClellan it's like I agree but Todd's not getting the job done so if they do this year bad I would get rid of Todd McClellan that's me because I felt like Pietrelli yeah he overpaid a little bit on a lot of his deals a lot most of his trades he's overpaid but he you know came the best that he could and so it's like you know, they've improved a lot, they've drafted good, they've done this good, and I just look at it like, I think it's the coaching's fault. And who are you say? I would say, I think personally, it's tough because with Todd McClellan, I really like him. Huge Todd McClellan fan. I really, mm-hmm. really like his style of coaching. Um, and again, since we're not doing this based off of what the reasons are that they would do bad, but... I would, I think, I think I would probably go Shirelli just because mm-hmm. I don't agree with a lot of his trades. I, I know that he comes in and he's addressed a lot of the needs. He has addressed the needs. Mm-hmm. However, he could have addressed them better for what he has given up. I just don't think that man has men won, won many trades. Oh, he's won his lot in his life. <laughs> I think that's that's one thing that's very frustrating with him, and I just that's one thing I can't see him going forward and doing any better than what he already has done, um, to a sense. But at the same time, I can also see the Todd McClellan argument of it. I mean, he did great in San Jose, but he never won him a cup, right? Mm -hmm. He's always been there, but he's never been able to get that next step. So I can totally see if he can't get him into that that next step, it's justifiable to move on and find somebody else. Mm -hmm. Or could you go with wild cards to get rid of them both? 100% if you want to do a full shakeup. Mm -hmm. I think... uh, it would have to be next season, yeah, because I don't want to get back into that trend that Edmonton was at the other year where they were having a new coach every single year and a new GM, and then all the players can't make good connections with their upper management and everything like that. But you've had McDavid now going into his fourth year, yep. and if you don't have Mc, if you've only made the playoffs once with McDavid in four years, you've effed up somewhere so bad that I think the GM, I'm not just going to change my mind. I'm throwing it out there. If they don't make the playoffs this year, with McDavid for four straight years, GM and coach get fired. That's that's totally fair. Yeah. And I think it's just because McDavid is the best player on the face of this earth. And if you don't make it to the playoffs, beating you know, half the teams in the West, then yeah, I think both of them should get fired. Yeah. Figure something out because it's obviously not working here. So I like it. <laughs> well, good. I'm glad. I just want to pick your brain there on that kind of like last little question there for the podcast. So I think we've kind of. Reach your time limit for today. Reach time limit for today, and we'll be back next, uh, hopefully in a week or so, and uh, get the third one. Absolutely. So, yeah, thanks again for joining the uh, Essential Oilers Podcast, Season 1, Episode 2 with Swites and Benny. Hope you had a good time. Comment down below. Let's have some discussion, and we'll see you guys next time.